Okay, share screen. Back to there. Can you see the screen now, everybody? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, right. Well, let's work. Let's work our way through this document. So this is the document on on the Moodle website at um, at week two, and obviously there the objectives for this week. And we start to talk about and we revisit in some ways some of the things that will be familiar from the introductory subject about this concept of legislative power and how then we move on to different drafting styles and the way, in a practical sense, that legislation moves through the legislature, that is Parliament. So it's a bit of an overview and in some ways some of these things will be very familiar to you because they obviously are a key part of the introductory subject. The first thing that I take out of these key terms is that we talk about a bicameral system. So we talk about the House of Representatives and the Senate in the federal sphere. But remember, in Queensland, we only have one House of Parliament, a lower house, the green as opposed to the red. Remember, the, the Senate has the colour red, the lower house traditionally in the Westminster system has the colour green. So when it's talking here about bicameral, in Queensland we only have a unicameral system because we only have a lower house. The federal house, the Commonwealth Parliament, bicameral, lower house legislature, um, uh, the House of Representatives and the upper house, the Senate. The second phrase here, government bill, uh, a bill is the, is the legislation before it becomes an act, before it is passed. And it's talking here about a government bill in the sense that most of the legislation is generated by the executive, so the departments, the legislation then is put to the House normally by the ministers. And the ministers obviously are from the government. So government bills tend to be put to the House by the ministers. And in that sense, they always will pass through the lower House. Because the government is the government because it controls the lower House. The House of Representatives in the federal sphere must be controlled by the government, by the Prime Minister and the Ministers, and because that's what makes them the Prime Minister and the Ministers. There are lots of private members' bills, but of course, very rarely do they pass through the House because the private member is introducing the bill in the hope of having some impact upon something, but they don't control the majority of members in that house. And so usually the only impact that a private member's bill will have is if a member is proposing some type of adjustment or amendment or a change to legislation that's proposed by the, by the government. So they're those key, key two phrases. Sorry, could you repeat the last part? Because um, the voice was cutting a bit. It was in that That's right. Clear. About about private members. The private, bill. yeah, about private members. Thank you. So normally, a private members bill will be put up by someone who isn't in the ruling party or parties. So say in the Commonwealth Parliament, there's a coalition between the Liberal Party and the National Party. A private member's bill would normally come either from an independent or from one of the Labor Party members or maybe the Green um, Party member. So someone who isn't in the government, who wants to do something different maybe, um, maybe they're, they're proposing something on an individual basis and normally that bill will not pass because they don't control a majority of the members in the House. Oh, okay. Uh, Dominic, could I just ask whether 
the system of green papers and white papers are used here because in Westminster they are. I think I think they are that that they circulate um, the bills in in a colour system. Um, I think from recollection that that they the Senate um, legislation before being passed is circulated in pink, and I think the lower house legislation is circulated in green, a light green, and I think once it's passed, it's in white. Um, I don't know if there's any, I don't know if there's any intricacies to that in the, in our system. But for example, the budget um, legislation or the budget uh, documents are circulated in white. The only reason I know that is because I've been down to a few of those budget um, evenings. Yeah, in the UK Parliament, uh, a green paper is issued as a sort of consultative document. And when it has been given uh, chance to the election, it becomes the white paper, which then goes before the House. So only once it's it's in a if it's in a bill form, it'll be in white. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and would it have bill on the front, or would it have you know an act of of would it describe? Uh, no, I don't know. No, no, that's the way they're described. Okay, any other questions then about those two? Um, yes, I have one question. With the unicameral uh, system that we have here, unicameral, yes. um, if the bill is not passed by the lower, it, it just passes by the lower house and it's voted and that's it. If it gets majority, it automatically becomes, a, um, it's passed. That's literally it. So the, the right. bill will be put to the lower house. The bill will be voted upon by the lower house. Um, once it's passed by the lower house, the clerk of parliament, the clerk of the Queensland parliament, will take the bill to the governor and the governor will sign the bill into law. And at the moment of the governor's signature, royal assent, it becomes an, an act of the Queensland parliament. And so there have been cases, and I've done one myself, where... Um, based upon the words in the Queensland Constitution, in the courts, there's been a challenge made to the constitutional validity of legislation which has passed in the House but which hasn't yet been signed by the Governor. And to some extent, I'm jumping a little bit ahead into this section on constitutional issues here because... Um, the constitutional issue that's relevant is that the power comes from the Crown mm. and the Governor represents the Crown. the Crown. If you look at the... Um, if you look at the Governor-General's website, it might not let me do it. Let's see if it lets me do this. How, how would it... Um, what I'm interested to know is... Usually, if if the lower if it if the bill is passed by the lower house, it still has a chance to be rejected by the Senate. That's and right. One, and the one that's that, that's controlling the government, they control the lower house. So if the one is controlling the government controls the lower house, and we are in a unicameral system, so the only legislation that is passed is the legislation that the government wants, and there's no control. That's right. There is zero control. So the executive right. completely control the legislature. So when people talk about separation of powers in Queensland, um, it it's obviously a unique scenario. Okay. okay. The reason I've brought up the Governor General's website is really a talk, we're talking about this constitutional, the constitutional issues. Um, I think this is a great symbol here because it symbolises... Um, a lot about our constitutional system currently. That is, that the source of power in our system is the Crown. Okay. The Queen is not the source of power. The Queen is the 
um, the individual that exercises the power of the crown, but it is the crown, this thing, this, well, it's not really even a thing in the sense that it's, there is a state crown, but it's, it's a concept that the source of power is the crown itself and that in Australia that power is exercised, the, the wattle being the symbol of Australia, by the Governor-General. Uh, and in fact, the Queen's role, only role, historically in the Australian system, has been to sign the appointment of the Governor-General on recommendation from the Prime Minister. So I think so that symbol... Oh, sorry, no, Nick. But as a, so following on from that, what happens if we become a republic? Then, well, obviously there'd be a change in the constitution, but the let's say the Governor General might just exercise the power of the people, which is maybe the US model, where the the head of state, and it, let's say if, if it's the Governor General's name is retained or maybe it's a different name like president given to the head of state where the head of state would exercise the power of the people rather than the power of the crown yeah. which is the US model and obviously there's a number of different possibilities there but um, so that we have a commonwealth constitution and it's a detailed document that sets out the three parts of government. Chapter one, the legislature. Chapter one of the, Const the Commonwealth Constitution creates the legisl legislature. Chapter two, the executive. And chapter three, the judiciary. The legislature, the two houses of parliament. The judiciary, the governor general, the prime minister, the queen, and the ministers and the departments that the ministers look after, and the judiciary in the Commonwealth context, the High Court of Australia, and the other courts that exercise federal jurisdiction. And the unusual thing in our system is that the state courts, the Supreme Court of Queensland, in fact also exercises federal jurisdiction. So it's, a, it's quite a confusing thing what as to what constitutes the Commonwealth judiciary or the judiciary under the Commonwealth system. So that's our federal system. Section 51 of the Constitution is mentioned here. I'm just going to bring it up. Can you see me typing that? Oh, yes. Yeah, very well. <laughs> Here we go. So here's section 51 of the Commonwealth Constitution. It's an interesting piece of, well, it's an interesting section in the Constitution because what it does is it says, these are all of the powers that the states will give to the Commonwealth. If a power is not mentioned in, these, in this section, then the states retain that power. So, for example, you won't see any mention here of schools or the police or the railways or water. Um, or When I say water, I mean rivers, internal waters. But in contrary, you will see taxation. The states still levy taxation, stamp duties, um, uh, excise duties on things like this, ta state taxes on petrol, payroll taxes, land taxes. Um, but, but income tax is solely a taxation levied by the Commonwealth. Um, military forces, quarantine, currency, coinage, legal tender, Banking. So these are the powers that the Commonwealth have, and obviously over time, a lot of these powers have been carefully interpreted 
by the High Court in different constitutional cases. But, but the first test is to see which arm of the Australian system, that is the Commonwealth of the States, which arm of those two has been given the power under this section? That is, has the Commonwealth been given the power or have the states retained that power? Bear with me. Doesn't want to reopen. <laughs> there it is. Sorry. All right. So... Then we have, so that's the Commonwealth Constitution in this paragraph here. We look. We've looked at section 51. There. The state constitutions are completely different. Originally, the states had a very simple set of powers. They could make laws for the peace, welfare and good government of the state, and originally it was of the colonies before they became <coughs> states, um, i.e. they can do anything. What's happened over time is that most of the states, and Queensland is a good example of this, we now have a constitution of Queensland. So this is the Queensland Government's legislation website. I'm not having much luck tonight. Everything's going very slowly. What's this saying? Here we go. Um, so here's somewhere. Constitution Act 1867. Constitution Act Amendment Act 1890, Constitution Act Amendment Act 1934, and this is what I'm looking for here, the Constitution of Queensland 2001. So what's happened over time is that the, and you can see it's been amended up to 9 August 2013. Over time, the states, most of them have done have effectively created a constitutional document that reflects what we see in the Commonwealth Constitution, an articulation of the head of state, the executive, the executive council, the courts, the judiciary. So effectively an articulation that goes beyond the original simple um, very, very short constitutional documents that were originally enacted and effectively articulates. Um, so I did a case uh, quite a few years ago when there was a merger going on between all the different um, local governments and so the case was about whether this section, Section 70, prevented the merger of all the local governments. And so we were fighting about what was the meaning of these words, that there be a system. What's the meaning of system? Does that mean you still have to have local governments? Could you abolish local governments, et cetera, et cetera, um, just as an example. So just be aware, I think, of those um, provisions. Keep shutting. Why well, keep opening and closing that document? Okay. If I understood you correctly, I'm sorry. I'm yes. gonna. Is that each each 
state is has its own constitution and they get amended all the time and now they're fighting over whether the 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 local um the local government of the states should uh, should be dissolved and one one government or if this is what you're saying or did I no. That was just an example. In the past, that was a, a fight that occurred at that time. Okay. So at the moment, we have the states, we have the Commonwealth, we have local government. Local government exists in accordance with the Queensland Constitution, as we just saw. And um, they're fairly stable documents. It's very difficult to change the Commonwealth Constitution it's a lot easier to change the Queensland Constitution. As you can see, it's been changed a number of times. Mm. All right, any questions about any of that so far? I know that's quite a bit to cover quite quickly. Uh, just off the, uh, the top there, Dominic, uh, any change to the federal constitution would require a majority of voters in the majority of states uh, to have the uh, constitutional amendment, but that does not appear to be the case in, say, Queensland. That's right. The Queensland Constitution, I think, has some entrenchment provisions that sort of keep right. it stable, but, but fundamentally, I think it's an act of the parliament and um, it could be changed. Whereas the Commonwealth Constitution, exactly as you say, requires a majority of the states, a majority of them, and a majority of the voters in the whole of Australia, in the territories and states. It's a very difficult to change. And I think from recollection, there's been four changes only ever to the Australian constitution. Um, Aboriginals have the right to vote. Aboriginals are citizens. Um, judges must retire at 70 and a senator who dies or resigns in office must be replaced by a senator from the same political party. I think from recollection they're the only four changes that have occurred since 1901. So it's a very stable, it's been a very stable document in that sense. All right, so any other questions about that stuff or any of the stuff we've looked at so far? In some ways, we, that's, that section there is a revision of weeks and weeks of the introductory subject, I think, without knowing the exact detail of what you cover in the introduction. Um, legislative rules. So this is the idea that, that even within legislation, there are different levels of importance. A good example, I think, is to have a look at um, the Queensland legislation. So let's have a look, for example, at uh, T for transport. Um, what they're talking about here is this idea that under a specific act, like the Transport Infrastructure Act, there will then be regulations that relate to that. Now, the regulations are less important than the act. And then there may also be Let's have a look at uh, one that I know about. So if you go to Legal Profession Barristers Rules Notice 2011, so we've got the Legal Profession Act, which governs lawyers in Queensland. Then you have specific rules for solicitors and barristers, and then there's some legal profession regulations. But if you go to this one, Legal Profession Barristers Rules Notice 2011, current is at 23 December 2011, you go down, 
you see it's very short. Uh, it says, let's make it a bit bigger. It's not showing on the screen, Dominic. You can't see that now? No. No. Um, move this win min window away from the shared application to resume screen sharing. How about that? No. Oh, no. No, it's still the same. So you're still, you're just seeing the... Um, uh, well, you've highlighted the legal profession, uh, brackets, uh, barristers' rules. Yes. Oh, okay, so I'll do it that way. So when you click on that, what it does is it says it doesn't actually show you the rules. It says they're not there. Queensland Bar Association. Then hide somewhere in here. Barristers rules. Can you see that now? No. Not yet. No. You've highlighted the download the barristers rule. Yes. But uh, that has not come up. Um, seeing, I think the main thing is is just to understand this, that <clears throat> what's happened is that the Bar Association of Queensland has passed some rules itself. It's made up its own rules. And the Queensland government has then said, okay, we're going to make those rules, we're going to give those rules statutory effect. And what this is talking about is that legislative rules will have less importance than regulations and regulations will have less importance than an act and an act will have less importance than the constitution. So there's actually a ranking of legislative instruments and we have to give a weight dependent on where that legislation is ranked. Constitution ranks above all else. Then comes an act, then comes a regulation, then comes a rule or a bylaw, Sometimes they call them different names. And in fact, on Tuesday, I had this exact issue. We had a, it was called a defects policy issued by the Queensland Building Services Authority. So it was just something that, that the Queensland Building Services Authority had done. But because they'd done it and they're a government body, over time it had been given some formality. It had been gazetted in the Queensland Government Gazette, which is like the government notice board, if we call it that. But, of course, there were regulations above that, and then there are acts above that. And one of the submissions we were making was, was that we were saying, what's in the act and what's in the regulations is more important, it has more weight, than what in that defects policy. And that's all this paragraph is trying to indicate, that there are different levels of importance even within legislative instruments. Rules, regulations, acts, constitution. So if, um, if, if one rule or bylaw um, conflicts with a certain thing that's said in an act, uh, therefore, we disregard what the rule says. We don't disregard it, but we will give greater weight and we will learn lots of rules that help us to work out the answers to that. But, for example, if I've got um, one rule that's very specific and one rule that is broad, I'll apply the broad one. Sorry, I'll apply the specific one. 
Um, the specific will override the general. If I've got a conflict between a rule and a regulation, the regulation will always override the rule, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you're looking, there are some, some things we will learn in coming weeks which will help us to work out the answers where there's problems like that. So if you just... that broad meaning, it overrides the narrow meaning. The, the specific, we go yes. for the broad meaning and not for the specific one. No, no, no. Sorry, I, around the other way. Okay. The specific uh, okay. overrides the general. Okay, all right. Uh, just a point there, uh, Dominic. Is that in relation only to the federal constitution or uh, it applies likewise to the Queensland? Same in Queensland. That, that if there's something in the constitutional, and you can, as you can see, there are a number of Queensland constitutional statutes, mm. 2001, the 1867 and the amending ones, if any of those makes a statement, um, then in fact that that will override the, the the specific. It might even it will override a specific act potentially. A, a simple example might be: let's say the Queensland Parliament passed legislation that anyone with blue hair was a criminal. <laughs> Completely hypothetical. Um, there, there obviously isn't a provision in the Queensland Constitution that says uh, people who are here are, are not citizens or have some criminality about them. So the courts might interpret some of the words in the Constitution about all people being treated, you know, in a fair way or in an equal way or something. They might imply words into the Constitution that might allow for that legislation to be unconstitutional. So there's, even if the words aren't specifically there, there might be a basis at law for... Um, there certainly would be a basis under the Commonwealth Constitution, but there might also be a basis under the Queensland Constitution. All right. Then we back to some of those things we were just talking about. Later statutes, which are inconsistent with an earlier statute. Um, the later will override the earlier. So if you've got something later, you override the earlier. Acts take are more important than regulations. This is an important one here. And this is section 109 of the Commonwealth Constitution. Let's see if you can see this. Oh. Can you see that one? Yeah. Okay, so when a law of a state is inconsistent with a law of the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth law will prevail and the state law will be invalid. So this is in the Commonwealth Constitution. So you've got a hierarchy whereby if the Commonwealth has the power to do it in Section 51, and they do it, they have to do it, they have to pass a law, and the state also has a law, Commonwealth will override the state. To the extent of the inconsistency. To the extent of the inconsistency, that's right. Yeah. And obviously, one of the great things I, I like about Osley is this note-up feature where it then goes looking for all the cases about 109 and you can see 1,202 cases and then you can put those in a date order. So I just clicked the date function there. And here's 6 November 2013, High Court of Australia, context. So somewhere here, here we go, section 109. Da -da -da -da. What's it saying? In its prospective, it is prospective in its operation. In Western Australia and the Commonwealth, the court held section 11 to be valid 
and that its effect was that any future state law, so this will be the case that I read about today involving fishing right, native title fishing rights. Yeah, native title fishing rights. So they've mentioned section 109 in that case and you can see it brings up 109 and you can click through and that's the only mention of it in the case. So I, that's a very helpful feature. We did mention that last week, but you can see then you run through it runs through all the cases that have mentioned mentioned 109. So that's that 109 is this third one here. Legislation made by the Commonwealth Parliament prevails over inconsistent state legislation on the same to topic. All right. So let's move on to this one here, drafting styles and conventions. Um, I think we're very fortunate in Queensland. Over a long period of time, we've had a very good um, system whereby uh, legislation has been reprinted, they call it reprinting, each and every time the legislation is changed. So let's find an act, um, QBSA, it's the one I was looking at on Tuesday. Here it is here, Queensland Building Services Authority Act. Historical versions. These are all the amendments to the Queensland Building Services Authority Act 1991. And what you can do is you find, let's say your issue, you say that a house or a, a warehouse was built incorrectly on the 23rd of September 2008. Well, what you can do is you can go down and say, well, 23 September 2008, the relevant version of the Act at that time was 8F. You can open up that copy of that. You can't see that now, but you can open that up and you can then check what the law was at that time in that regard. A lot In a lot of states, they don't have that. In fact, I think most of them do now, but certainly in up until quite recent years, um, you didn't have a government website which reprinted or, or clearly articulated what the status of the legislation was at a particular point in time. And so this is quite a good feature now, and it's quite important to double check that the legislation wasn't different. I recall when I was working in Canberra, in a very significant case, the council who were appearing in the court got the wrong, they were in the High Court and they got the wrong version of the Act. And so they, one of the judges said to them, you've got the wrong version. And so the case had come all that way and they, they weren't using the right version. And I think the Queensland legislation website assists that type of problem because it's got this quite clear set up like this. I think most of the others have followed suit in the last few years though. So I'm going to let me back out there now. Concerning the cases that are mentioned in the book, yes. Uh, how important is it for us to um, have a summary of the facts of the case and the um, what was argued and, and everything? Are we to consider them as just examples, um, or are we to actually really detail them? 
I would view them as just examples. I, 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 I uh, remember as a law student spending day after day, week after week, sitting in the library reading all the cases, and I look back and think I was crazy that <laughs> I, I, I spent all that time reading all those cases and, and in fact, it didn't really help me to... to I, Maybe it did. I don't know, but I think I think use them as examples. Um, refer to them. Um, take the key issues out of them, but uh, but reading them, you know, reading sixty pages in a detailed way, I wouldn't wouldn't be doing that or encouraging you to do that. Right. I mean, obviously, there's two cases on the assignment. There two that you will need to look at in in greater detail and analyse those. But even there, there's some key things that you need to take out of them and you can pot potentially take um, that out of them quite quickly. Talking about drafting styles and conventions, we just mentioned the Queensland Legislation website. Um, one of the things you'll find now is that over time, the legislation is becoming more and more uh, or, or larger and larger, I should say. Um, it's not uncommon now for acts to have three, four, five hundred sections. I think I remember reading once that in Queensland in, say, 1900, there were only about 25 acts. Now there's probably, um, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 pieces of legislative or legislative uh, instruments. I remember um, in my former chambers, we had all of the Queensland legislation and it took up pr probably five metres by five metres by two and a half metres high. It was a huge amount of legislation. And uh, it, every time an act was changed, you got a new version. So I think drafting styles, the drafting style in Australia has become longer. It's become more comprehensive. That requires more interpretation by the courts. Um, obviously, the more sections you have, the, the greater the chance that people will miss sections. And if you look at cases like... Um, uh, can you see what I'm typing? Yep. Cases Di like Fingleton. Di Fingleton's case. Mm. Um, have I spelled that correctly? I think you have, yeah. F I N G L E T O M. Very slow. Maybe it's because Zoom's running. It's quite slow this evening. Mm. I don't know why it's taking so long to load. Maybe it's just a large search. In any event, um, the reason I mention this case is the case went to the district court. From recollection, I think it went to the District Court, the Court of Appeal of Queensland, special leave in the High Court, and it was only in the High Court that one of the judges on special leave mentioned a specific section in the Magistrates' Courts Act and said, well, surely this section has relevance to the Chief Magistrate's position. That section had not been mentioned in the Queensland courts at all. And, but what I took out of it is that the, the greater the volume of legislation, the greater the chance that people will miss things. And there's another challenge, and that is that for members of the public, no one could possibly know all of the legislation that might impact upon their life. And, of course, if you want to comply with things and do the right thing legally, you need to have knowledge of the law. 
So that case, uh, which went to the High Court, was a good example, and, and that's all it is, just an example of, um, of that circumstance. All right, so um, they talk there about what used to be the Trade Practices Act. In fact, it's been repealed now. Um, that's what the textbook refers to. Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act is quite, it, it was a great section in this sense. Everybody knew about it. It was the, uh, a corporation in trade or commerce that misleads and deceives, cannot mislead and deceive. And so it had a great impact upon Australian society in the sense that if I try to sell you a bottle of water and I put on that bottle of water something like you will live forever, um, that would be misleading and deceptive and consequently I'd be breaching section 52. Or if I, try, if I said, do you want to buy this car and I sold you the car but we never discussed the fact that the car did not have an engine, that also might be Section 52. So, uh, in fact, that section's now been included in the Competition and Consumer Act 2010. And the Trade Practices Act has been repealed. It doesn't exist anymore. Oh, that's what it says there. So it was a good section, it was well known, and that's one of the challenges. You change a section and now it's not so well known. People... Was there any, sorry, Dominic, uh, yes. was there any particular reason for uh, uh, doing Change. away with the Trade Practices Act and uh, substituting it with the competition? Well, uh, it's an excellent question, and I can tell you that I... I've been frustrated with it a few times because we all got to know those sections really well. They were well interpreted and then it's gone. I mean, it's now called the Australian Consumer Law, but it's, it's, it's difficult because no one actually knows that it's, that it's there and they don't know the sections, whereas everybody knew Section 52 and there were some fantastic sections in the Trade Practices Act that people really got familiar with. Um, in any event. I mean, they've all been carried over to the new Act, but they're not as easy to find. They're hidden in the schedule. So when you go to the... Can you see the page that I've got up now? So when you go to Commonwealth Legislation, Commonwealth Consolidated Acts, Competition and Consumer... Act 2010, there it is. You, you think, all right, where's section 52? You go down to 52. Not there. See how it goes from 51 AEA to 75 B? The section 52 provision is hidden down here in Schedule 2. And you go, misleading and deceptive, no matches found. So it, it makes it quite difficult to, to actually quickly find what you, you know, and then see you type in misleading, more than 100 matches. So they've made it quite difficult. Um, you can see it's all here. And, in fact, there it is, Section 8, uh, um, Section 18 of the comp of the Australian Consumer Law is exactly the, the old Section 52. But it's just not as easy to find it anymore. So it's a good question. Um, drafting guidelines. This is a really important thing because one of the things that has been said in Queensland in recent years is that the drafting style has changed that the length of the drafting and the style of the drafting 
regardless of what's actually in the legislation, is actually changing You see that now? That the drafting style has actually changed the outcome. But even if the parliament is intending for legislation to be efficient, to be um, simple in the way that it's worded, to be fair in the way that it's worded, the drafting style is making it inefficient, is making it unfair, and is making it um, complicated in, in finding it and in working out what the answers to things are. And, and unfortunately, the only people who benefit from that are the lawyers. Yeah. And, and to be honest, we don't want that either. So it's a real challenge because um, the more legislation, the more the whole system is complicated. So one of the things Parliament, the executive, have tried to do is to simplify the drafting mechanism over time. Um, you can see that say, saying something should be of the highest standard uh, isn't really going to achieve that outcome. So you've got to be very careful about how you how you do it. And, and obviously, Office of Queensland Parliamentary Council, in that sense, is very important. Um, they have this Legislative Standards Act 1992, which gives which is which itself is an act which creates guidelines about how acts will be drafted and how the mechanism will occur. When it talks about natural justice, it's talking about fairness. Natural justice is just an administrative law name for fairness. I mean, obviously, this is what is being sought, plain English drafting, that is, um, acts should be written in a language which is simple, precise, direct and familiar. But you don't need to go very far to see the difference. And I'll give you an example. Let's have a look, for example, at the uh, Partnership Act 1891. Here it is. It's 131 sections, but most of the sections are fairly uh, understandable. A partnership subsists between persons carrying on a business in common with a view to profit. It includes an incorporated limited partnership, etc., etc. It's pretty. It's pretty efficient act um, when you look at it. Let's have a look at another one, though. Let's have a look at the... This is one I did an advice on the other day. The Body, Corporate and Community Management Act. Well, so to start with, 435 sections, six schedules. Look how long the dictionary is. So they're just the definitions to other things in the Act. Most of these sections, that one's not too bad. A lot of these sections are quite long though. Those ones actually don't look too bad. The area of body corporate law could perhaps be more complex than issues of partnership? It is, and it's an ongoing, um, there's a lot of changes in this Act. I mean, this Act's changed a lot of times. Um, but I think there, it also just reflects that Parliament are, are involving themselves more in our, in our existence. Good or bad, right or wrong, I'm not commenting about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think... And this is not just in Queensland. This is the whole, um, pretty much throughout the Commonwealth and in the United States, government is, is passing more and more legislation. And so I think that's why this subject is so important because 
rather than judges making decisions about things, judges are now spending more and more time interpreting what the legislation says. Um, and, and so that's why, obviously, this is a very important process and a very important subject. Um, obviously, there's an attempt to avoid unnecessary words and an attempt to simplify the wording. I think of the three of them, this, this third one is the one where the drafts persons have been very successful. If you do read an, an act from the 1850s, I mean, one sentence would be an entire paragraph and it would be very, very um, difficult to understand. And so the sentence length is now certainly shorter. There's a greater use of paragraphs, subsections, paragraphs, subparagraphs, and a greater breakup of, of the, in the way that it's done. Um, in Queensland and in the Commonwealth, we have Acts Interpretation Acts. You can see I was looking at this yesterday on, on something. We have Acts Interpretation Acts that help us to define words that are in other acts, something like an individual um, or a magistrate. So, so obviously uh, the word organised didn't uh, get a mention. It didn't get a mention. No. So, I was, so the act that I was looking at was... I was in here in the Fair Work Act in section 421, uh, 417, sorry. Industrial action must not organise or engage in industrial action. So we're focused on that. So you can see, the first thing you can see here is in Osley, no blue means there's no definition in the Act. So I noted up the section, check the date, it reorders them. I then, you can see, Director of the Industry, CFMEU. So these are the cases where that section was examined. So I was looking for some discussion about the meaning of the word organise. And I went through a whole range of cases. In fact, um, the solicitors working with me did this process. You can see I didn't do it myself. But I, I then got printouts of the ones that did mention it. You can see I was checking the Acts Interpretation Act and a whole range of other things. Um, The Acts Interpretation Act can be very, very helpful on some things. And so I often will always check that to make sure there's nothing in there that doesn't impact upon the wording or the words or the section that you, you're often looking at. Um, they just mentioned some other examples here using shorter sections, which is something I mentioned before. Greater use of headings, more definitions. And... And even in the Acts Interpretation Act, it'll talk about the importance or otherwise of headings or definition, etc. Income Tax Assessment Act 1997. I wouldn't describe that as one of the greatest pieces of legislative drafting. Um, the problem with tax law in this country is that we have two primary taxing statutes. the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 and 97. So there's an example of a difficult problem in drafting. The problem is that if you amend the tax legislation to try to make it simpler, what does that actually do? It creates uncertainty. So I amend it all the time, 
but when they amend it, they don't delete the old sections, they just add new sections in. So you get these ridiculous sections like 102 AAA. That's because they don't want to delete a section that's been there since the Act was passed. They want to only add. By adding the interpretation that's been given to this section in the past stays. And then there's just a question as to what the new section means. That's, that's a good thing in one sense. It's a bad thing because you end up with sections like 109ZCA. So it becomes quite complicated. Although it may have an effect on... Um a case law uh, under the previous act. As it was previously, yes. Yes, like a 1936 case law uh, may have uh, determined something. That's right. And uh, But not in the act of 1997. So no. you could still go back to, uh, to the 1936 act uh, yes. to see the case. Uh, yes, and... and I mean, and, and that's what these do. So, um, for example, uh, to work out the meaning of residency, so this is income. Um, to work out what's accessible income, you have to include your ordinary income. To work out your ordinary income, the first test is, are you an Australian resident? You click on Australian resident and it takes you to the definitions in this Act, so we're in the 1997 Act here, 97 Act, um, and when we get the definition of Australian resident, wherever it is, it then says, an Australian resident is a person who is a resident under the 1936 Act. Mm -hmm. It directs us back to the 1936 Act, and then we go to Section 6, we go down to residency. I was just looking at this on an issue the other day. That's why I know it. Um, we go down to resident, and here's the definition of a resident. Person who resides, person who's domiciled, person who's been here for half a year, person who has super here, uh, or in the case of a company, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that hasn't altered since 1936. Uh, they've changed it over time. So what these, this part here was original and this bit here was original and then they've added this bit in about superannuation. So they've amended it, but they've left a lot of the original stuff there. And um, what that means is that when judges have interpreted this bit, in 1940, 42, 48, 50, whenever they did it, that law is still valid and relevant and, and continuing. And so that that's why they've taken the course they have. They're very hesitant to throw out the Tax Act and try and rewrite it because, of course, that would give everybody a new, fresh chance to say, oh, that's not, that's not income, It's um, it was a gift, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. So everybody would then challenge the ATO's position on everything and it would be a merry-go-round all over again. So these changes are not referred to as regulations? No, they're, they're amendments to the Amendment. original Act. Original Act. Yes. And so mm -hmm. in COM law, can you see that? Yeah. In COM law you can track, so this is the Commonwealth's, Legislative, um, you go current, I for income. You can chat, uh, track the amendments. So here's the current version of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936. Um, they, they, they say prepared on 2 October, your series.
and then he can track back through. Here's all the amendments, and there'll be millions of them, as you can see. Yeah. So every time that act's been amended, so the next thing you'd need to check is um, if we were having a, uh, a disagreement with the ATO about the income tax year 2009-2010, and the income question was relevant as at um, 21 September 2009, we then need to go and find the relevant version of the Income Tax Assessment Act as at that date to double check that the, what did I say, 21 September? Yeah. They prepared, so it's probably that one to double check to make sure that the act at that point in time, what did it say? Um, and don't get me wrong, we might also then look at the act today to see whether it's changed over time and that might impact the court's position mm. or impact the submission we might make. Um, and, in fact, that discussion we just had about um, the Income Tax Assessment Act and redrafting is effectively what's discussed here. Stone, I think, is one of the cases mentioned in your little question. Um, and I've seen that some, some, of, some of you have done an analysis of that, a case note on it. Um, statutes obviously are broken up into sections and subsections, divisions, parts, headings. Some of that can be very, very helpful. We've spoken, I've shown you a couple of interpretation sections. Um, some of it can, can create its own challenges because you're trying to work out where something is. Procedures, how do, how do bills go through the House? We can summarise that quite quickly. Normally, a minister will put something to the House. It will normally be read three times. Generally, the tradition was the first reading, it was a tabling. Here it is. Go and have a read of it. Grab a copy, have a read. Second reading, debate. Third reading, vote. And that was the, the traditional history of it. First reading, tabled. Second reading, debated. Third reading, voted. The second reading was normally started by the minister who sort of informally introduced the, the bill to the House, indicated the, the delicacies or the intricacies of the bill. Um, a lot of that's changed now. You'll see some legislation that is read a first time, a second time and a third time in the one sitting. It used to be it would be tabled this month, three months, six months, a year from now, it might go off to committee and then come back. So some of those things can happen over time. Um, promoting ambiguity. Sometimes ambiguity doesn't really exi exist. Um, what they're saying is that sometimes... There's no real ambiguity, but we argue ambiguity on behalf of our client or, or a client will argue ambiguity because they want to get a contrary result. Um, I don't know if that's right. I, I mean, I think any wor words have different meanings. The, the English language isn't perfect, and in that sense, words will have different interpretations and as, you, as we discussed right at the start, what's the meaning of organise? Um, does that require a positive act? Can, can organise include communication? Is it something more than that? So there are a whole range of factual nuances that can change the outcome of a specific word. Um, Let's spend some time now working through these questions and then that, that'll be the conclusion for this evening. Um, question one, what section in the Commonwealth Constitution lists the legislative powers of the Commonwealth Parliament? 
52. Definitely 51. And I think I changed... Originally it had 52 on it, and I changed it. It is definitely 51. Cool. That was a yeah. trick. Uh, and, and we put that up earlier. On, uh, we actually put that section up earlier. Which one of these statements is true about the introduction of the Civil Liability Act 2002 in New South Wales so far as it relates to the common law of negligence in that state? So in Queensland, we actually have the Civil Liability Act Queensland 2003. Sometimes, by the way, you'll see Queensland Acts with QLD. The High Court just go Q, just like that. Anyway, the Acts do the same things. Did the Act replaced or significantly altered an area of the common law? The Act complemented and strengthened the existing common law. The Act worked retrospectively. The Act had no effect on the common law. Well, firstly, an Act will always have some effect on the common law, so it's not dead. Secondly, the Act worked retrospectively. There's normally a presumption that Acts will not be retrospective. It's extraordinarily unfair to do something retrospectively. So normally it won't be retrospective. So it's going to be one or two. The Act replaced or significantly altered an area of the common law. Well, that sounds right. Significantly altered. What's that? It replaced or significantly altered the common law. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It, it didn't just leave the common law and add to it. It changed it. And so, is that what is that what it says down here? Okay. All right. Third one. Ministers who are responsible for the drafting of new legislation can request the drafting to take one of two key approaches. Section 52 of the now repealed Trade Practices Act 1974 took what sort of approach to drafting? An expansive provision which gave judges broad power and discretion a general provision leaving its scope for courts to determine, a specific provision which provided a clear and comprehensive law. Well, if I say the words misleading and deceptive, is that clear and comprehensive? Do you know exactly what I mean by the words misleading and deceptive? Yes. So... It's expansive, isn't it? It's a wide, broad definition. Gives judges the idea of determining. So if I open a new restaurant and I put a large M out the front of the restaurant, a judge will say, well, surely you're trying to mislead and deceive and convince others that your restaurant's either very similar to McDonald's or it is McDonald's. So it gives judges a discretion. And it leaves the discretion in the hands of the courts, the judiciary. So the answer is A and B. When a new piece of legislation is being introduced into Parliament, at what stage does the responsible minister begin the debate about its purpose? And I just mentioned that before. Second, Second reading. reading. I hope I'm getting that right. Second reading speech, yes. Um, question five. Elizabeth Campbell is quoted in your textbook referring to fussy versus fuzzy drafting, aligning the former approach with the common law legal system and the latter with the civil law system. Which one of these attributes was not listed by her as one of the pros of the common law drafting tradition which our system adopts? About the clarity, so accessible to lay people. Just say that again. Sorry, Shelley. Well, it was about clarity and how understanding it was. So I'd say it would be accessible to lay people. 
It's not, not a good thing to contain judicial discretion. Comprehensive, specific in detail. What does it say down here? Accessible to lay people, okay. Maybe I'm getting tired. It doesn't sound like that important a question to me at this point in time. Don't quote me on that. Question six. According to your textbook authors, which one of the following attributes is not necessarily part of the plain English drafting style for legislation? Simple and straightforward. That sounds plain English to me. Language which is direct and familiar. That sounds plain English. Using more expressive language, that does not sound like plain English. And getting rid of unnecessary words, that does. So the answer would be C. Question 7. Section 15AC of the Acts Interpretation Act 1901 Commonwealth provides some guidance about interpretation of plain English legislation which supersedes earlier legislation what guidance does this section provide? Case law interpreting the earlier section may still be referred to. New plain English sections should be interpreted as they stand. Ideas shall not be taken to, the, to be different merely because different forms of words have been used. And later acts supersede earlier acts. I'm going to solve this problem. I'm just, you can't see what I'm doing now. I'm just going to have a look at the Acts Interpretation Act 15 AC. Okay. It's C, ideas shall not be taken to be different merely because different forms of words have been used. Okay. And eight, one of the drafting conventions for amending legislation attempts to assist with interpretation by maintaining numbering in a particular manner when new sections are interposed, assuming that the Parliament wishes to add a new section between an existing 10 and an existing 11, what would the Convention dictate the new section should be numbered? 11A. What? Sorry, 10 and 11. 10A. Yeah. My name is Dominic. I'm just trying to work that out at this point. Question nine. Most legislation is introduced into the parliament in what way? The government, bill. government bill. That was, the first, in fact, the first thing we discussed tonight. All right. So we've gone through... Um, interesting, I, I got tired as we got to the questions at the end, but we've gone through... Um, that tonight. I hope that's been of some benefit. I'm going to pause the record now, if I can.